Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening for some of you. Let me welcome you to our very special webinar and thank you for joining us today. My name is Jan Luprich. I'm Business Development Manager at Iris AI. And from our team, my colleague Kimberly Talent Ziggy is also with us, who supports our clients as account manager. Kimberly, are you looking forward to our session today? Yes, I'm definitely very excited and especially to have our guest here today. So that's that's really great. Well, indeed, correct. It's an exciting time, and I'm very happy to welcome our special guest once again, Dr. Alicia Garmulevich, who is CEO and co-founder of Materium. Hello, Alicia. How are you, if I may ask you? Good, thank you. Nice to be here. Great. But before we get started, please let us confirm that you do not need to take any notes during this session. If you do not wish to do so, this workshop will be recorded and shared with you afterwards. So if you have any questions during the meeting, please feel free to share them with, uh, with us through the Q&A channel or, or the chat. We will be happy to address them. All right, let me share with you my screen. Here we go. Uh, we are pleased to share with you the results today of our uh, cooperation and how the Iris AI tools have contributed to the success of a very impactful project of Materium. So let's get started. And we believe that appropriate to start our webinar with a statement, uh, which is sustainability means innovation and innovation needs R&D. And R&D needs time, the most precious commodity we all have in common. And as a consequence of all the world's current challenges, unprecedented ones, uh, such as advancing global warming, but with a too slow progress on carbon capture, or energy insecurity and food supply crisis resulting from the Russian aggression in Ukraine. Researchers need time more than ever in order to drive innovation for a sustainable future across all industries. And especially when most of the heavy industries in mining, chemistry, pharma, or material engineering are committing to transform their production towards carbon dioxide neutrality. So our main two questions today are the following ones. How can natural language processing, a subdiscipline of machine learning, save vastly more time for R&D to innovate? And how can systematized data extractions uncover hidden knowledge scattered in thousands of research papers to contribute to the success of R&D teams and impactful, impactful projects like Materiums? Looking at the agenda, we would first like to introduce you to the Researcher Workspace, our comprehensive platform of research tools. Then Dr. Alicia Garmulevich uh, will share with us more about the goals of the project and how the extract tool has been implemented for their use case. And we will look at um, how to set up the extract tool for your use case too, of course. And as already mentioned, of course, there will be time for Q&As. But before we dive into these topics, we would like to briefly introduce our team. Iris AI is a cross-European deep tech startup with extensive expertise in the field of natural language processing, which is especially challenging machine learning task when it comes to scientific or technical text understanding. And this is the area where our international team has been intensely dedicated to over the last six years. Here we can see our founders who established the company in 2015 with its headquarters in Oslo. And we are proud to say that our award-winning AI engine is also the beating heart of the research workspace. So what's the research workspace? In one sentence, it's a flexible, scalable software suite for processing scientific knowledge, where your content, research content, is in the center. By the scientific knowledge here, we mean scholarly, technical, and research documents, from research and clinical papers to patents or to internal documentation. By processing, we mean most activities from simply finding the right content, right document, all the way to extracting the key data, auto-generating summaries, and automating repeat processes. Why that? Uh, the aim of the research workspace is to support you and your teams with most parts of systematic, systematic literature processing. By automating these manual and often tedious tasks, uh, your team can greatly benefit from our tools. As we can see here, 
In terms of time reduction, our clients have reported time savings of 75% in finding the right information in more spot on articles compared to regular searches and manual review. And in addition, they can also better understand the, the market landscape, for instance. When it comes to accuracy, for the tasks that can be fully automated, we have a demonstrable 85% accuracy, which is on par with human accuracy, by the way. And finally, the tools save personal time and energy for tasks that actually require human intelligence. So they increase our performance and efficiency. They are easy to use for every researcher in any department, whether it's the IP department, R&D, post-market surveillance or pharmacovigilance department. Everyone can benefit from the power of Iris AI's machine learning capabilities. So you do not need to hire any new team members like machine learning experts. It's important to mention that the tool collection of the research workspace can be further tailored to the specific needs of your research group or university as well. The core Iris AI machine learning engine is trained on a large set of scientific articles, but the machine's understanding of some particular research fields like material science, polymer research, oncology, and so on, can be easily strengthened and trained to yield even better results. This happens within, with minimal uh, to no human interaction, and there is no need for taxonomies or manual labeling, which usually takes several weeks or even months uh, to create and to get the machine up and running. Secondly, we always address your specific challenges and offer you access to the tools that you really need to solve these challenges. And finally, in the research workspace, you can work with most any type of scientific and research content whether it's open access or payable research papers, patents, internal documents, gray papers, white papers, and so on. So here we can see a landing page of the researcher workspace with your own research projects and data sets. When the content is added, you have access to a broad variety of smart tools that you can apply and combine as needed. Every research process is a little different and your research workspace will enable any workflow. So based on your specific use case and needs for processing the scientific literature, you can apply the following five modules to your data sets. The first one, it's the explore tool, which stands for a content-based recommendation engine for broad exploration and uh, helping you uncover new interdisciplinary relationships and novel solutions based on the on context provided. The next one is the Analyze tool, which provides you with a document set analysis, what all these articles are about, and it gives you a sort of bird's eye view over your content. With abstractive summaries, you can easily create an intelligent, coherent text of one or multiple abstracts or even full text documents. These summaries are great for either rapidly reviewing larger document set of similar documents or even to kickstart your scientific writing. For instance, in medicine uh, or in pharma, it can be meta-analysis. To narrow down your result list, you can also apply a range of smart filters that allow you to add more context, like, for instance, application of, of a particular chemical or intended use of a drug. It can be otherwise hardly expressed with one or three keywords, for instance. Or you can use as filters also extracted data points or entities for some filtering tasks uh, detailed specificity is, is needed. And finally, you can complete your research task by a systematic extraction and linking of data points, data points, ranges, or entities of your interest. The IRIS AI tools provide solutions for several industries, such as pharma, chemistry, material science, biotech, or engineering, but also for university libraries, of course. Depending on the task, task specificity and industry, different results can be targeted. For instance, better understanding the market landscape and competitive knowledge, automating processes like pharmacovigilance or post-market surveillance, or increasing research project margins or expediting IP analysis. But what all of these use cases have in common is undoubtedly the need to accelerate innovation and avoid manual tedious, task, tedious, tedious tasks that slow it down. For your reference, here you can see some examples of our corporate and university customers 
among them Materium, of course. But you can see here listed as well some well-known journals that reported on the Iris AI search engine. We believe that these names can serve as a proof to you that Iris AI is a trusted partner and we know what we are doing. At the beginning of this year, Iris AI and Materium started their collaboration on a large project supported by the Extract tool. And at this point, I would like to give the floor to Alicia so that she can share with us more details about their exciting project. Alicia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, I, it's a real pleasure to be here with, um, with Iris and the whole team today and be able to share um, some points of our collaboration <clears throat> and the motivation behind it. It's been a a real lucky, you know, lucky uh, partnership. I feel to have to have been able to find Iris because it's certainly core to our our whole development process now, and very much core to our mission being realized. Um, so, and the team so far has been incredible to work with. So it's just been it's it's been a real pleasure, and I'm excited to share um, some more context for what we're doing and why we're doing it. So I'll share my screen now and go on to. Their presentation. So Materium, our mission is to grow a regenerative materials economy and regenerative materials for us are materials that actually are net positive for the economy and for the environment. We focus on bio-based, 100% bio-based um, materials and 100% biodegradable. So materials that after end of life actually go back and nurture the soil or, or actually add nutrients to any given living system from which they came. And so we are focused very much on this growing sector of um, the materials economy that very much is growing up in the shadow of the large plastics pollution problems that we have that is growing in magnitude um, every day. We, uh, we see plastics, microplastics in our drinking water, in our bloodstream, in pretty much any animal food chain you look at these days. And, uh, and we have a very, very acute issue that we need to solve very, very quickly because plastics production is growing as well. So um, we look at creating a kind of broad, base approach to transforming the entire industry. We look at regenerative materials being needed to be invested in at small, medium and large scales worldwide. So we're really trying to provide a data layer that can help grow this economy. And I'll get into how we're, we're aiming to do that. But we really see that rather than looking for kind of a silver bullet or a few materials that are really going to, you know, um, supplant the, the handful of petroleum polymers that dominate our, our world today, we're really looking at what makes sense at a local and context specific level. So for instance, um, we work a lot with seaweed biopolymers that grow in very many parts of the world, but don't necessarily make sense in more inland areas, um, as well as food waste that makes sense a lot near, near centers of population. Um, and we, a, another point of emphasis on the idea of regenerative is that we very much wanna shift the industry focus away from primary sources of biomass. And what I mean by primary are, are sources of biomass that are used for food or feed, um, animal feed. So for instance, corn, soy, these kind of products that are usually, that actually dominate today's bioplastics market, they can have um, unintended land use uh, change effects in terms of climate emissions, um, degrading biodiversity, uh, a, lot of, a lot of unintended kind of consequences that are not necessarily um, where we wanna go when we wanna invest in a new materials economy. So we're focusing a lot on materials that are a net positive. Now the challenge of this area is that there's a huge demand for regenerative plastic alternatives. You know, we need them everywhere, a lot in packaging, single use packaging is a big hot area in textiles. It's all petroleum polymers as well. Um, a huge dominance of, of, um, of petroleum uh, based textiles and uh, like all the polyesters for instance and many other sectors too. Um, but there are a few examples of commercial success in this area. And they're, they're growing, but they're nascent. And <clears throat> the commercialization challenge is quite difficult 
Um, new materials take a long time to develop in general. Matching solutions to particular market needs is, is, is quite difficult and laborious. And a lot of high level scientific knowledge is required from the initial formulation chemistry that needs to be developed. There's a huge, imagine like it's like cooking. You can change your ingredients by just adding a little bit more of uh, salt or sugar or what have you and, and the actual resulting material changes. And so navigating all of those possibilities and trying to match them up with a specific market niche is something that is, um, is very, very time intensive and costly for today's startups. And finally, um, feedstock, um, in terms of these regenerative sources of feedstock, like um, agricultural byproducts, food waste, um, seaweed, other types of biomass that are regenerative by nature, those are actually quite distributed in nature and so quite difficult to concentrate a huge amount of, um, uh, it's hard to centralize and scale up in the way that petroleum does. And so we have to look at different business models for those supply chains. And so it's important to invest in the knowledge and the data necessary to understand say feedstock heterogeneity and, and, and difference over types of geography and, and seasonality and these kind of things. So it's again, a data issue there as well. So in a nutshell, Materium is building a suite of solutions that can help holistically to grow this market, grow the kind of um, bedrock of this market so that more people in more places can get to market faster. And we want to low, lower barriers to massive market entry is what we say, because we want a lot of players in a lot of places to be able to be successful in their regional um, markets rather than having some sort of global dominated supply chain. In order to do that, we're developing the following. So first of all, we are leveraging, we want to develop a large data base which is exactly where a, uh, Iris AI comes in. So we're looking at um, developing this with the scientific literature that already exists. There's an incredible wealth of material formulations and property data that's quite cumbersome for any given startup to be able to access and specifically to analyze quickly. And so we're looking at extracting all of that information, putting it in one place, and then creating analysis layers that allow any given entrepreneur to quickly make sense of the types of materials that they want, might want to integrate into their processes and the kind of properties that they can um, expect so that they can match that with a particular market of interest. Um, on top of that, we are looking at layering a marketplace whereby <clears throat> consumer good companies can um, match the performance needs of their product with a suite of potential suppliers from the biomaterial space on the basis of actually those, those material properties, again, matching up. So if you have a portfolio, if you're a startup and you have an amazing variety of seaweed-based plastics, you want to actually see where those potential market, <clears throat> those potential buyers could come from. And so that kind of matching process is what will facilitate. And we anticipate a large amount of possible matches in the sense that close but not perfect. And so this is where our robotic platform, AI-powered robotic platform, comes into play, where we're working with super labs in Greece to develop an autonomous um, robotic system of material formulation development and testing so that we can take potential formulation, formulations that have promise and then tweak them and optimize them for particular market niche. So again, with that kind of cooking analogy, you might be able to change like a process parameter, more heat, for instance, um, or change um, the percentage of one ingredient and that make, may make the difference. <clears throat> and so we're aiming to use that platform to make those possible matches, <clears throat> pardon me, um, a sure thing. And then finally, we're looking at characterizing um, the availability and heterogeneity of supplier feedstock to assess scaling potential. And we're looking at um, a number of different avenues to do that, um, including um, developing a data layer where we can better assess feedstock heterogeneity based on what's been already characterized in the scientific literature. So to put a spotlight on where we're focused now in that development picture, um, we're really focusing on building out this large data set of 
um, recipes and their properties. And that is going to be the beating heart of both the, um, uh, the, the, the ability to basically optimize and, and help new companies quickly uh, identify a formulation that they want to commercialize, which is a kind of market pull mechanism. So we want many, many, many more startups to get to get into the game faster. So that's going to be the the main focus of our our work there, and it's going to be an open database so that you know um, it's democratizing access to this kind of information. And then further optimization, it will feed into the optimization engine, whereby if a, um, an entrepreneur or a company wants to tweak their formulation, that can also be informed by formulations in the same neighborhood that have been tested by the scientific community. And so that those two um, functions are really where our partnership with Iris AI comes in, whereby we are really um, attempting to pool the world's data on biomaterial um, development and performance. Um, and and make it useful to to the world's entrepreneurs. Um, and I, I'll just also signal a couple of new directions in terms of the data that we're also interested in. We're also interested in um, being able to put information out there on biopolymer extraction. So a lot of these biopolymers that are at the basis of these kind of recipes of new bioplastics, um, the way that they're extracted, the method that they're extracted, the specific species or varieties that they're extracted from, all of that has an impact on the resulting properties. And so being able to get a handle on that information is really uh, important. And then secondly, we're looking a lot at um, processing conditions. So how materials can actually be, um, they, their material properties once more get altered with the kind of processing technology they need to interface with, so the type of you know material uh, processing machines that actually make, say, plastic films or plastic bags, all of that has an impact on the resulting properties and getting that right, that mix right, um, getting your formulation right for a particular process technology is something that data can really inform as well. So those are some of the, the future directions of data extraction that we're really uh, excited about. So I'll close with that and, and then um, I'd be I'd welcome any questions from the team and, and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Alicia. And uh, yeah, so while listening to your presentation, I came up with some questions that maybe as well is uh, interesting for, for our audience today. So first of all, how did you get this idea to create such a database? Um, I imagine it's not just coming overnight. Yes, it's certainly been something. So my uh, co-CEO, Liz Corbett, and I had um, basically had a meeting of minds uh, a few years ago upon founding Materium that uh, really crystallized a lot of our research and doctoral work that we'd been doing up to that um, time. So for me, the insight came where um, I'd been working in the sustainability world for um, a while in terms of being able to study and trying to understand the kind of key sticking points that were preventing the cycling of materials uh, at a kind of more abstract or broader scale. And one of the main issues there is that, you know, if we're looking at a centralized manufacturing system where all of this comes back into um, has to go back into production, um, it's very difficult to imagine just being able to take up all those little distributed bits of waste and put those back into a centralized manufacturing system. And so if you look at the way that nature works, um, you can see a much more distributed, much more nested way of cycling nutrients um, within local, regional and um, ecosystems. And so that's, that's a model that we saw as very compelling, but the material world is certain, like our material economy is definitely not fit for purpose. It doesn't actually work that way. And so the biomaterial world and the way that you can source feedstock locally and put that back into production at local and regional scales, that was a very compelling approach to unlocking this kind of systemic rigidity that, that we saw. And so I started studying that problem. And, and the main issue when you look at how we can unlock more local and regional capacity for making materials and making them effective at those scales is knowledge, um, is, is data and access to information and how to make materials. And that's very, um, it, it's very remote 
from a lot of um, your, you know, a lot of people's access points to information today. And so um, that kind of access to information was, was the kind of galvanizing point of, of developing materiums that we could be the place where um, people would be able to do has use as a starting point for R and D and get to market faster, and then since then it's built into really having deep dives into talking to entrepreneurs in the field, talking to businesses SMEs that are making amazing plastics and um, biomaterial alternatives, and seeing the challenges they face in terms of getting those materials to market. So it's kind of deepened. Um, over time, but that's that that was the genesis of really understanding the kind of missing link was really access to information if we're going to have this more systemic change from a very centralized manufacturing system and centralized material economy to a more distributed one that allows for biomass regenerative sources of biomass to be effective. Right. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And um, you already explained a little bit and Jan will also go more into details about how our extract tool is working. And um, yeah, so to, to make all this data accessible or to, to gather all this data, of course, you need either a lot of time to manually extract all the data points or you have an AI, an AI tool like ours that helps you speed up all the process, right? And uh, yeah, so I was just wondering, how did you hear about Iris and uh, why did you choose us then as a collaboration partner? So Liz was the one who stumbled across Iris. I can't remember um, if it was through, I think some, some colleagues of, of hers. Um, I can't remember the exact point of reference, but it certainly stood out to us as being um, a solution that we were looking for specifically focused on the scientific literature. So we've been aware that, you know, the field of natural language processing obviously is, is growing in, in depth and breadth, but um, Iris's specific focus on scientific papers and scientific data itself was, we knew made the most sense. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, it was an obvious fit from that perspective. Perfect. Um, yeah, and me as an account manager, I'm very closely working together with you and your team um, to develop this project. Um, so in your own words, how would you describe our collaboration so far? And do you think that we already had some major challenges that we had to overcome together? Yeah, I think um, one of the most interesting and important challenges that has um, shaped the first stage of our collaboration has been um, really just getting to grips with the nature of the information that we're trying to extract. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something that um, I've really been um, grateful for the amount of feedback and transparency in terms of what the challenges are, what the team's working on, and then being able to feed in with our, you know, uh, domain knowledge um, as and when it's needed. So the, um, I think that's, you know, I'm sure there's going to be challenges right the way through, but I think grappling first with just the type of information, how it's, um, how it's visualized, portrayed um, is, is, is the main, main one that I've seen, uh, you know, shape, shape this first stage. Right. Yes, and we are very happy to be collaborating with you because it's it's always very helpful when our clients are very responsive and give feedbacks and tell us actually the questions so that we realize as well, you know, sometimes you're so deeply into the topic that maybe you don't understand which words the outside world might not understand. So it's it's very helpful to, to be working with you. And this already leads me to my last question. So you already um, talked a little bit about the challenges. Um, what would you tell maybe someone on the calls right now thinking to be collaborating with us or any other AI startup? Um, so what would you tell this person um, what they should be expecting or what they should have in the back of their head? Any advice? Yeah, I think um, I think one of the the main things that I would emphasize is is the importance of the journey of of being able to learn and iterate and um, be responsive to the challenges along the way because it's certainly a field or an area of uh, solution space that really requires. Um, just just a lot of engagement with the topic. It's not something that's kind of like, um, you know, something 
magic that just suddenly <laughs> will appear in your doorstep. It requires something that, you know, it's the technology is incredible. Um, but it's even more incredible when you have the partnership between two companies with, in our case, Iris and Materium that can really um, enrich the process and enjoy the, the journey of, of make it, basically getting the most out of that technology. Because, you know, I think the more you put into it, the more you can get out of it in some ways. So I think um, I really enjoy that process of working with the team. And I think that um, it's, it's a really exciting learning process for us to understand how far you can push the technology and what results you can get and how that fits with the, the mission and the time frame that we have and the goals that we have, et cetera. So it's a kind of, uh, it's, it's definitely a learning process. And I think that should be, um, enjoyed. Um, and I think that's what we've enjoyed so far is that working with the IRIS team has, um, has brought that level of, of, you know, uh, learning and feedback to the team, which is really enriching. Um, so I would say that that's, that's the most important thing at, at, uh, at least from what I can see is that yes, the results are what we're all looking for, but you have to enjoy the journey along the way because, um, it really does inform a lot of, um, Oh, yeah, a, a lot of the expectations you have, it can, in, it can, you know, in, in our case, it is increasing a lot of the expectations that we, you know, we can see in the future of like expanding our work with Iris, um, in addition to being a lot more zeroed in on exactly the, the results um, uh, this year. So it's, uh, it's, yeah, I would just say it's, it's a learning journey and enjoy it. <laughs> Thank you. We also enjoy it. And we also learn a lot more about regenerative materials, which is also really great to, to learn more about this, this important field. Thank you, Alicia. That's all the questions I had from my side. And I think now it's time to give it back to, to Jan for the last part of the presentation. All right. Thank you very much, Alicia. I have also one question. It's a giant project, right? And the idea is very impactful. How big is your team, if you can share with us? Um, we're around 12 at the moment. Um, and so we have a range of um, uh, different specialties um, from the more sustainability and um, business uh, side to uh, specialists in engineering, AI, and um, green chemistry. And then we have a good tech team as well, which is which is uh, growing all the time in terms of being able to develop the kind of platform solutions that we have. Yeah. I need to ask also, thank you, additional question. And the last one from my side, what's the ultimate goal? How many documents you would love to process and to extract valuable information in there? If you could give <laughs> us some estimate. We know, but probably uh, the participants might be interested in. Sure. Um, so we're, we're looking at this being in stages, um, but certainly, um, so the short answer is every material science paper related to biomaterials that is published and will be published in the years to come. So we see this as an ongoing thing, um, as well as new knowledge gets published every year. Um, and we also, I should say that, you know, our platform is built for collaboration and, and um, contribution of data. So we're not just focusing on the extraction, but we're also inviting scientists to contribute data directly as well, which sometimes, you know, some of it is not even published because it's not necessarily relevant to a particular journal, but it actually enriches the field. So we're looking at that being um, an avenue for, for growing the database as well. Um, in terms of numbers, we're currently focused on the amount of data that we can get that's open access in order to get off the mark and have a really good database to, to showcase to the world. Um, and so we, uh, that's around 50,000 um, articles at the moment that we're looking at. Um, when you start looking at the world of um, uh, data that's behind paywalls that would require um, a collaboration with some journals or some sort of uh, negotiation in terms of access, you're looking at easily the hundreds of thousands. Um, and so that's the, that's the kind of backlog, I would say, of knowledge that exists. And then, of course, year on year, the amount of uh, time and investment and in science that's going into this field is growing year on year. So um, we hope that we hope to work with Iris on an ongoing basis in order to be able to continue to have like a, uh, 
um, that that knowledge come into the database and and be a kind of living and growing thing. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. It's organic, and uh, that's why I would love to also share with you uh, something more about the extract tool, uh, how it works, and what you can expect from the tools, how to set it up. So at the end of this webinar, we would love to explain to you uh, exactly what you can what you can expect from the tool, right? And how could you can apply it to your use cases. As already mentioned, manual extracting and linking the data you need from, from a PDF or free text, tables, graphs, figures, and plethora of layouts requires major effort from highly skilled manual labor. So what our extract tool can do for you is to fetch and link, link all the key data uh, from these documents and systematize them into a tabular machine readable uh, format. So in other words, a full month of data extraction work can be done in minutes. And here you can see two documents. The first one is a research paper on hypertension and the drug called sildenafil. Uh, to the right, you can see a different type of PDF, which is a patent with a long range of, range of still experiments. Two different documents, but both are quite lengthy, having also a lot of tables within the text, as you can see right now. So let's imagine you want to make a qualified decision about whether to invest in developing a new drug or material, or you would you want to get a comprehensive overview about you, what your competitors are doing, or just simply need to systematize and extract all the data points and entities you need to investigate before your team goes into the lab. Uh, so let's say you have hundreds, and as we have just heard, you have even thousands of similar patents or research papers to examine, uh, clinical reports, for instance, as well, or any other kind of uh, scientific or technical content. What we have learned from our clients, it's mostly the case and material just confirmed that. So what can we do about it? The PDFs we have seen are sent to the Iris AI system. It can be one simple document uh, at a time or hundreds or thousands of them in a batch. Here we can see an example of what we call output data layout. In other words, machine readable spreadsheet that is created by you or together with our team to indicate what data you want to have extracted from these documents. So these can be, as already mentioned, named entities such as chemical compounds or polymers, inhibitors, ingredients, drug names, or values, units, or data ranges indicating, for instance, specific properties like a tensile strength, material thickness, or cooling temperature, or adverse effects about a certain percentage. This kind of data points, we want to have the machine to collect and systematize them. So what is going to happen? The extract tools identifies all the domain specific entities, then locates the tables and extracts the data from rows and columns and links the data between the table and uh, between the text and table. In order to present that with all the desired data populated and linked into your spreadsheet. Uh, but again, this can also be presented in another machine readable format uh, of, of your reference, of your preference, an integrated lab tool or a database or whenever you need it. In addition to linking the data, the extract tool also handles abbreviations and varying terminology. This can be specifically challenging, uh, especially challenging by patents, for instance. Furthermore, unit conversions into your preferred format, like from Fahrenheit to degrees Celsius, and then text legends in a random location, explaining what data you find in the table. So we match our goals, and the extraction process can be performed within minutes by the researcher workspace, as opposed to weeks or months of extracting and systematizing this manually. And the good news is uh, that the extract tool will be soon fully integrated into the platform. Here you can see an example of it. The process is pretty, pretty much straightforward. You will simply choose your articles and add them to your templates for processing. When it comes to how our results are measured, we want to be always clear that we go about our work scientifically, for each and every tool, we have 
measure the results compared to human results, which is why we can say that the results are as good as manual effort, but if, at a fraction of, of the time. So of course, the performance of the machine is evolving and getting better and better, which will lead to even better results in, in the near future. So we've almost made it to the end of our seminar. To wrap up our session today, the Researcher Workspace can contribute to the success of your R&D teams and also universities in following ways, by providing a unique set of NLP tools, natural language processing tools, that can be applied to all your research data processing or just to the specific research task of your choice, like data extractions. You do not need to be an expert in AI, in AI or machine learning. All tools are easy to use. Secondly, the, the research workspace is a highly scalable system that can be quickly adapted to your field of research, like material engineering, for instance. No extra effort is required on the client side uh, to reinforce the machine learning uh, engine on your area of expertise. No manual labeling, no, no taxonomies. Um, it's not needed, not required from, from our clients. Iris helped significant, significantly speed up the research process to make sure that our best and brightest um, in R&D teams do not waste time doing things that machine can do for, for them and for the society. The researcher workspace is a content-centric tool, which means that you can adapt it to any type of content. And uh, finally, our team is fully dedicated to your projects to provide op optimal solutions to your problems. At the end of our session, let us remind ourselves of the inspiring words of the genius of the 20th century, Albert Einstein. We can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. And uh, we hope that today we have provided you together with Alicia with some evidence that collaborative efforts and the use of also the right tools, right technology can solve at least some of the problems such as researchers lack of time, the need for high accurate results or automating repetitive, sometimes tedious tasks like data extraction so that R&D can foster innovation for a more for a more sustainable world. All right, this is from our side. Uh, I was wondering if there are any questions and we can see some of them. And that's one, I'm not quite sure if this is for Alicia or for, for uh, Iris AI. Do you already partner with chemical companies? Well, maybe I will start to, <laughs> To, to, uh, to answer that. Yes, we do partner with chemical companies uh, in terms of data extraction, analyzing the right content and to speed up their processes in, in across various sectors and departments. So from our side, we also shared some uh, logos at the beginning. We can confirm that. Maybe Alicia would love to comment on that. Um, so at the moment we don't we don't have any uh, partners in chemical companies. Um, there's certainly companies out there that are investing a lot in um, in the kind of bio space, bio based chemical space that um, would be really interesting to explore um, relationships with, specifically in understanding the whole supply chain um, in order to develop uh, bio based materials and how that can enrich the information that we're aiming to put in front of. Um, startups and SMEs and companies um, that are developing bioplastic and biocomposite alternatives. Um, but uh, we're at the beginning of those kind of collaborative relationship stages. Thank you. Uh, we can see here also one maybe more comment. Uh, I would also, the comment is as follows. Uh, I would also target CFOs to translate these features uh, as tangible cost savings with webinars. So <laughs> you are more than welcome if a CFO is interested in new technology, in, in sustainability, in innovation, and how to save you know, budget of the company. Uh, if you will deploy right technology, definitely you are more than welcome to get in touch with us and uh, we can have a separate session or we can also do a joint session for, for uh, this particular uh, topic, cost savings 
and innovation. I hope we covered it today also partially. Right? If there are no other questions, we hope you enjoyed the session. We surely did. Thank you once again, and please feel free to get in touch with us. I would love to thank once again to Alicia for joining our session today and share, for sharing uh, information about their exciting project. So it's very appreciated. And I wish you, Alicia, and your project lots of success. And uh, we, we are happy, as already mentioned, that we can be on the same path and support you in your endeavors. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And thanks for the collaboration ongoing. Thank you also, Kimberly. Thank you. Goodbye, great, everyone. Have a great rest of the week. Goodbye. <laughs>